Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. Last episode, we added some instructions that made programming a lot easier, jump and branch. Today, we're gonna continue to make programming easier by making a call stack. But first, I wanna introduce a new assembly feature called labels. Labels allow you to use a word for an instruction address instead of a number. In our assembly language, they always start with a dot and they get placed before the opcode. For example, consider this program. It starts by comparing register one to register two, and if they're equal, it branches to the halt, skipping over the increment. But if they're not equal, it increments register three and then halts. Let's add a label named skip to line three. Now, whenever you write dot skip, the assembler will literally replace it with a three. So on this line, you can just write dot skip. When the program gets assembled, it'll get replaced with a three before becoming machine code, because that's what the value of dot skip truly is. Okay, but why do this? Why make a label and then write the name of the label instead of just writing three? Well, what if you wanted to add more code to the start of the program? If you did that, then three wouldn't be the right number for the branch anymore. You would need to fix it and make it point to the halt again. But if you use labels, this problem doesn't exist. The branch isn't pointing to a specific number anymore. It's pointing to a label, and the actual value of that label will change automatically, thanks to the assembler. Next, consider this Fibonacci program. We've seen Fibonacci programs before, but this one is cool because it uses a loop. Depending on what you set register 1 to in the beginning, it'll produce a different Fibonacci number in register 4. If you set register 1 to 1, register 4 will end with 1. Or if you set register 1 to 6, register 4 will end with 8. This program has three labels, fib, loop, and done. And thanks to these labels, you can put this code anywhere in the program and it'll still work. If you put it at the very beginning, then fib resolves to zero, loop resolves to four, and done resolves to 10. Or if you put it later in the program, they'll resolve to something else. But the point is, it doesn't really matter what these labels resolve to. In fact, most of the time while you're programming, you won't even know what they resolve to, because you don't have to. All that really matters is that when you say something like jump label, it jumps to that label, wherever that may be. Okay, so hopefully it's clear by now that jumping and branching are super important for programming. They allow for things like if statements and loops. But as you get into the higher levels of programming, you might realize there's kind of a problem. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say you want the fourth Fibonacci number. Easy, just set register one to three and use the Fibonacci program. Then you write some more code, and then later on in the same program, you want another Fibonacci number, let's say the sixth one. So you set register one to five and write the Fibonacci code again. This works, but now you have duplicated code, which is not a good idea for many reasons. One reason is because if you find a bug, you have to remember to change it in both places. That might not sound that bad, but what if there were 20 copies? It just gets really annoying, and you don't want to run the risk of forgetting to change one. Another reason is because duplicating code is a waste of space. Why should you have to say how to calculate a Fibonacci number again if it already did it before? That seems very inefficient. It would be much nicer if you could just write the Fibonacci code once and reuse it, or call it, every time you want a Fibonacci number. So let's introduce a new instruction called call with opcode 12 and mnemonic CAL. Call is basically the same thing as jump. It takes one address as an operand, and when it's executed, it jumps to that address. So now, if you want the fourth Fibonacci number, you can do the following. Set register one to three, and then do call fib. This jumps to wherever fib is located, and you'll get the fourth Fibonacci number, as normal. But after it finishes, we still need some way to return to where the call came from. So here's what we're gonna do. When a call is executed, it's not just gonna jump. It's also gonna save where we left off in a special register called the return register. Specifically, it'll save the current address plus one because that's the address of the next instruction once we get back. So now, once the Fibonacci part is done, all we have to do is jump back to what's in the return register. To do this, let's introduce another new instruction called return with opcode 13 and mnemonic RET. Return has no operands. All it does is jump to whatever is in the return register. Let's place a return at the end of the Fibonacci part, and now it'll jump back to where we left off. What we've just done is created a subroutine a set of instructions that we can call to execute on demand and return back to where we were. And the amazing thing is, if you want another Fibonacci number later, you can just call the subroutine again. There's no need to duplicate code. Just like last time, it'll jump to fib, run it, and return. Let's look at another example of subroutines. In this program, there are two subroutines, one named add1 and another named add2. And then there's the main part of the program at the beginning. So let's go ahead and run this. 
The first instruction sets register 1 to 0, easy enough. The next instruction is a call to add 1. So it jumps to add 1 and saves the current address plus 1. Then the add immediate adds 1, and the return takes us back to whatever was saved, which is right here. Then there's a call to add 2, so it jumps to add 2, once again saving the current address plus 1. Then the add immediate adds 2, and the return takes us back. Then there's one more call to add 1, so once again it jumps to add 1, runs the add immediate, and returns to halt. After the program halts, register 1 has a 4. This makes sense because we just called add 1, then add 2, then add 1 again. Alright, let's make call and return in hardware. First, I'll make the return register over here on the left. On a call, the current address plus 1 should go into it. And the nice thing is, the current address plus 1 is available right here, so it's really easy to plug in. Then on a return, the output should go into the program counter. So I'll take the output and plug it into this MUX, making our first three-way multiplexer. The program counter now has to choose between an increment, a jump, and a return. And in Minecraft, building this is honestly really straightforward. This is how I would make a return register, and it's very similar to all the other registers I've made so far. It's just a bunch of repeater locks stacked on top of each other. But before we put this on the real computer, you might have noticed that there's a problem. What if you tried to call a subroutine from within a subroutine? For example, what if you wanted to make a subroutine called outer, which calls the subroutine add1? Well, let's try it out. There are now two subroutines, add1 and outer, and in the main part of the program, there's just a single call to outer. At the start of execution, the call will jump to outer and save where we left off. Then there's a call to add1, which jumps to add1 and saves where we left off again. But hold on a second, that just overwrote what we already had in the return register. Now there's no way to get back to the main part. We screwed ourselves. So what if instead of having a return register, it was more of a return stack? Like a pile of return addresses that you could just keep throwing more onto. Let's try again with a stack and see what happens. We start with a call to outer, which jumps to outer and puts where we left off on the stack. Then we have a call to add one, which jumps to add one and puts where that left off also on the stack. Then we have an increment and a return. But where should the return go? Should it go to the first thing that got saved or the second one? Well, it should probably go to the most recently placed thing on the stack, because that must have come from the most recent call. Now we're in business. Next, there's another return, which will look at the most recent thing again, taking us back out to the halt. Let's do another example. This time I'll make a subroutine called add3, which calls add1 and then add2. The first call jumps to add3, then it calls add1. Once add1 finishes, it returns to the top of the stack, which is here, then it calls add2. Once add2 finishes, it returns to the top of the stack again, which is here, and then there's one last return, which again takes us to the top of the stack, which is back to the halt. Let's go ahead and update our computer to have a stack instead. Now the call instruction looks like this. It jumps to the address and saves the current address plus one onto the stack, which is called a push. And the return instruction looks like this. It puts the top of the stack into the program counter and then removes it from the stack, which is called a pop. One thing to note here is that while stack is much better than a single register, there's still a limit. A stack is not infinite. For example, let's say you made a subroutine that calls itself. Now when you call it, it calls itself, which calls itself, which calls itself, on and on forever. Except it's not forever. Eventually the stack would run out of space, causing what's called a stack overflow. So for our computer, let's just make the stack 16 layers deep. Back in Minecraft, the easiest way to make a stack is with a bidirectional shift register, as seen in LRR number 8. If you imagine this as the top of the stack, then you can push to the stack by putting data here and shifting right. Push 1, push 2, push 3. Notice how 3 is the most recent push, so it's at the top of the stack. Then to pop the stack, shift left. Pop 3, pop 2, pop 1. Now, there are many different designs for a bidirectional shift register. The one I just showed is kind of the classic design. It's three blocks wide per cell, and it uses two sets of repeater locks, facing in opposite directions. When you shift right, it uses the top set of repeater locks. And when you shift left, it switches to the bottom set. Here's another design created by my friend Katari. This one is two blocks wide per cell, and it only uses one set of locks. Shifting right follows this pattern, and shifting left follows this pattern. Pretty clever. But if we want to use any of these for the real call stack, we're going to need to make each cell 10 bits instead of 1. Remember, instruction addresses are 10 bits long. So I'm just going to choose the classic design and stack it upwards to make 10 total layers. And this is the finished call stack. 
To test it out, let's go ahead and write a 7 and push it, then I'll write a 10 and push it, and I'll write a 12 and push it. The top of the stack is reading a 12, that's a good sign because that's the last thing I pushed, and then pressing pop will pop the 12, showing 10. Pop the 10, and now it shows 7. Pop the 7, and the stack is back to empty. All we have to do now is hook this up to the computer following the diagram from earlier. And here's what that looks like. Everything should be good to go. Now, you might notice that the computer looks a little bit different from last time. The program counter is up here now, and the control ROM got shoved underneath. Don't worry about this, it's just because I'm starting to put the computer into its final layout, which looks like this. It still matches the diagram perfectly. So let's go ahead and run the add3 program from earlier. Assemble it, paste it in, and run. While it's running, you can actually see it pushing and popping from the stack, which is really cool. And once it's done, there's a 3 in register 1. Beautiful. Clearly, subroutines are a huge help in making some really cool redstone programs. But they're not just cool in redstone. Concepts like subroutines and functions show up all the time in many high-level languages. So if you want to learn more about high-level CS, then check out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is the best place to learn not just CS, but all things math, programming, and data analysis as well. It's a platform that focuses on interactive lessons to teach you in the most effective way possible. So whether you're building a bridge or visualizing neural networks, you'll build critical thinking skills rather than just memorizing. And the lessons are available 24-7, so it's easy to fit into whatever your schedule is. Out of all the things Brilliant offers, data analysis is my weakest point, so recently I tried the Exploring Data Visually course. It was really cool. I got to parse through massive data sets, and I got a sense for seeing real-world trends. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 